I'm going to tell you a little bit about tidal disruption events. When uh, a star gets too close to a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, uh, and creates a, a, a light display for us. And I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about where we're going in this talk this evening. Um, so we'll start with just a general overview of supermassive black holes. We'll talk a little bit about supermassive black holes in general, um, what we know and why they are important um, for, for, for really understanding all of, of uh, galaxy evolution. Then we'll talk about the specific case of a supermassive black hole. Uh, could be a quiescent supermassive black hole. It doesn't have a lot of material falling into it originally, but then this star gets too close. Um, one star's death gives life to a black hole, and that black hole system becomes extremely bright um, for a very brief period of time. And by brief, I mean uh, a, you know, a few months. And then I will give an example from my own work on using these reverberation light echoes to map out what we think that material, that infalling stellar debris, um, looks like before it passes beyond the event horizon of the black hole. This is my favorite uh, image of the universe. This is the Hubble Deep Field, an, an image that is very um, popular and well known. Um, I just love it because it is this, it just kind of encompasses everything that we're talking about. Um, in this image you have galaxies, some are very nearby, um, just a few hundred million light years away, some are very um, distant, so the, the beginnings of the universe, almost, you know, just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, uh, all encompassed in one uh, shot. That, is, that on the sky is about a 30th the size of the moon. So all of this was 10 days of exposure with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and what they did was to point to a blank field, something that, you know, where we didn't really know of any other objects before the Hubble Space Telescope was launched. And in the very beginnings of, of HST, the Hubble Space Telescope being launched, when everyone wanted to use it, the director, Bob Williams, said, okay, I'm going to look at nothing. I'm going to use my director's time to just stare at this blank space for 10 days, 10 valuable days, and this is what we found. And I think it really has opened up our eyes, not just, you know, in, in this, in making this beautiful image, but that all of the astrophysics that has come out of this, people are still analyzing these fields and finding new, um, new things uh, every day. So some of those galaxies that you see are elliptical galaxies, like this one, that may form from the, the merger of many galaxies, so you're kind of seeing them as these kind of blobs with, with not any real clear shape. And some are the more um, classically beautiful um, spiral galaxies, like the, the well-known Andromeda galaxy. Um, so just as an aside, the Andromeda galaxy is 2.5 million light years away. It's our nearest neighboring galaxy, as, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, and it is the only galaxy that is moving towards us. All the rest of them are moving away from us due to the expansion of the universe. But Andromeda is close enough, close enough to the Milky Way uh, that is gravitationally bound. And in, um, in, in a few billion years, our two galaxies will merge together and perhaps form something like the elliptical galaxy that you saw on the previous image. And a few years ago, I was asked to go back to my elementary school to give a talk to some kindergartners to explain what it's like to be an astronomer. And I was going to show them a bunch of pretty pictures, basically, of, of different astronomical objects, and I showed them the Andromeda galaxy. And I just kind of mentioned this, you know, kind of cool fact that Andromeda and the Milky Way are going to merge together in like four billion years. And, and I was going to move on, and just like immediately, like all these hands went up in the air, like, what's going to happen when we, when we merge with the Milky Way? How is it? Are we going to feel it? on Earth, and you know, all the teachers are getting upset, and I'm just like, oh, don't worry, kids, like, we're not, you know, the sun is going to turn into a red giant by that time. <laughs> 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 so, it really kind of derailed the conversation. <laughs> it didn't help me on any other slides, actually. <laughs> so, this is the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, 
But what we now know is that in this Hubble Deep Field, all of these galaxies, nearly all, if not all of them, host a supermassive black hole at their center. And they range in mass from, uh, you know, like a million solar masses, times the mass of the sun, to even beyond a billion, 10 billion times the mass of the sun. And we know this uh, in part because of observations from in our very own Milky Way galaxy. We have a supermassive black hole sitting at the center of our galaxy. We call it Sagittarius A star because it's in the constellation of Sagittarius. Um, and there has been very heroic work for the past uh, several decades using adaptive optics um, on the Keck telescope in Hawaii to trace out the trajectory of individual stars uh, at this, close to the center of mass of our, uh, of our Milky Way galaxy. And what I'm going to show you is, is a video of, of their compilation of tracking this trajectory since 1995, you'll see in the top right hand corner. And what we find is that these stars are orbiting around some object. So you can see even that one coming in very close and kind of whipping back out. And that is because there is a massive object that is 4 million times the mass of the sun. So we know, um, you know, based on the trajectories of these stars, that they must be orbiting around something that massive. And yet we don't see you know, a very obvious uh, bright object at the center there. So up to this point, up to this week, in fact, this was the best evidence that we had of the existence of black holes. But now we have this new image and that hopefully many of you heard about. This was a big, my week has been really crazy and exciting because <laughs> this image came out. Um, this is the supermassive black hole at the center of M87. It's a, it's a galaxy that is 55 million light years away. And uh, a collaboration of international scientists using seven telescopes, seven radio telescopes around the world um, have combined to uh, make this image, make a virtual telescope, basically the size of the Earth, uh, that they call the Event Horizon Telescope, and have imaged the central regions around a black hole um, and spatially resolved that region for the very first time. So in all of my other talks, you know, I, I always have to say, well, we cannot image a black hole. They just look like point sources uh, to our telescope. And now, as of this week, I can no longer say that, um, which is very exciting. And so what we know, so this dark um, shadow there is, is, is basically due to, well, the, the, the ring that you see is hot gas that's um, being bent around the space time, um, the, 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 the strong gravitational well of this central black hole at the center there. And you can see this dark shadow at the, at the center um, is in part due to material that is, uh, is uh, a lack of material because material is plunging past the event horizon, um, past this point of no return where no matter can escape, not even light um, can escape. And so this is now the most definitive evidence that we have of the existence of, of supermassive black holes. I work on supermassive black holes for, for a living, and so I would say that our evidence was pretty darn good before uh, Wednesday, but we are all really excited about, um, about seeing this. So if we were to zoom out, just to kind of give you a sense of scale, this M87, um, or this supermassive black hole that's about uh, a billion times the mass of the sun sits at the center of M87. If we were to zoom out uh, about a million times, this is what the, the M87 looks like, the galaxy, so an elliptical galaxy, imaged with the Hubble Space Telescope. And so it kind of gives you a sense, look at, remember those, all of those galaxies that we saw um, from the, the Hubble Deep Field on the first slide, and that was just one thirtieth the size of the moon, and it kind of gives you a sense of, of what an incredible feat it was for them to image um, the black hole shadow, the Event Horizon Telescope. So these black holes that sit at the centers of all galaxies, all massive galaxies for sure, um, they're not just decorative. 
They're actually extremely important for understanding how galaxies evolve over time. And this is something that we see evidence for, but we still don't understand how it works in detail. So this, the, the reason that we think that black holes and, um, and their galaxies are, are kind of related is, is uh, because of a plot like this that we call um, the M sigma correlation. Basically, the mass of the black hole scales with the mass of the, um, of the galaxy. So they can track the trajectory of bulk motions of stars in the central regions, and they can use that to, to um, you know, constrain the, the mass of the galaxy, and they find that there is this correlation. And this is kind of amazing, because the galaxy is about a thousand times <coughs> more massive than this puny black hole sitting at its center. The gravitational sphere of influence is very small and should be negligible compared to the gravity of this very massive galaxy. And so why does the galaxy know anything about the black hole at its center? And this is something that is, you know, if we can understand the role that the black hole plays uh, in, in shaping the galaxy, uh, it can help us understand how galaxies evolve, how the Milky Way looks, and why it looks the way that it does. <coughs> so the reason that we think that, um, you know, the, the question is, how does this black hole convey any information to the larger scales in the galaxy? And uh, you can go back to this image of uh, M87, and you can see here um, in addition to this large elliptical galaxy, this kind of white blob that you see, you may notice this uh, colored in blue um, jet that's coming out from the center of this galaxy. It's actually coming from the, the black hole itself and piercing out to these large scales, 15,000 light years across. And so this is in part these large jets are a way for the black hole to communicate with much larger scales in the galaxy. And a better example of this, um, you can see more clearly this effect of the interaction between the black hole and the galaxy at large is in this um, cluster of galaxies. And, and so this is not just one single galaxy, but it's actually um, you know, many thousands of galaxies that are gravitationally bound. There's one galaxy at the, the center of this, um, the, the, the most massive of these galaxies is, sits at the center and it has what we call the, it's called the brightest cluster galaxy and it has a supermassive black hole at its center. And in this image we're seeing that this, the supermassive black hole is at the center um, of the image there and you can see these jets, again the same kinds of jets that in M87 on the last page, um, that are being kind of viewed out, and you see them in radio band um, here. Uh, it's, it's just the radio Im image of these jets. What's cool is that you can see in the blue is the, the X-ray emission. X-ray emission is coming from the hot gas that's sitting uh, between all of the galaxies. So this, 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 these clusters of galaxies that you can see as the, the, the white points in the optical, are sitting in this bath of hot gas, intercluster gas. And what you can see in the top image that's just looking at the X-ray image alone, there are kind of holes in the hot gas, so where the radio lobes are punching through. So the black hole at the center is producing these large jets that can, can basically push out the hot gas from these, the, the surroundings of the galaxy on very large scales. And as it sweeps out all of this gas, it, it, it heats the gas even more. It prevents the gas from cooling and forming stars and growing the galaxy in the way that we know. And so this is what we call feedback from this active galactic nucleus, this central supermassive black hole, is, um, is producing all these relativistic jets that kind of halt the formation of, of new stars in the galaxy. 
And this is really what we want to understand. We can see this process happening in large scales, in galaxy clusters, because they're just so large. And we can see um, you know, these, these kind of bubbles that are uh, inflated in the X-ray band. But what we want to understand is how does this happen in just normal galaxies? How does this, how does this process shape um, how all galaxies were, have evolved? You know, we, we think that there is this connection between the, the black hole and the galaxy in which it resides. We know these, gal these black holes are, are capable of producing these large-scale jets. But how does this process work in detail? Um, what's powering these jets in the first place, and how do you how do you even get extract energy from a black hole? Um, and so this is a, a, an artist's representation of what we think uh, it, it might look like around a black hole. Um, you know, in, in all but one of these black hole systems, we can't image it directly. Um, but you know, this is an artist's representation. Basically, material from the galaxy will, um, some of that material will be gravitationally bound to the central supermassive black hole. And as that, that gas comes in, um, it will, you know, it will form into a disk of material. And a lot of people ask me, like, why does, why do, why do we see disks in the first place? Why doesn't material just, I mean, like, shouldn't black holes just kind of, you know, like a everything just fall into the black hole. Well, you can think of it basically because of, of conservation of angular momentum. So everything will have a little bit of angular momentum and that builds up over time. Let's take, I have a, a supermassive black hole in, in this hand and I'm trying to um, throw a point particle of gas into this black hole. If I, you know, I would need to have extremely perfect aim for it to hit the black hole and enter, you know, go past the event horizon. More likely, I'll miss just a little bit, that hot gas will whip around and eventually get into orbit. And this will happen from <coughs> particles of gas coming in all different trajectories, but eventually that hot gas, those point particles, will, will hit each other, will collide with each other, and then they will all start gaining, um, you know, angular momentum, and, and coming together and eventually forming into a disk. So this is the same you know, thing as, as, as what, happened, what, what causes Saturn's uh, rings, this conservation of angular momentum. We really can't get away from forming disks um, around these kinds of compact objects in astrophysics. So the same thing is happening in um, supermassive black holes. Actually, the kind of funny thing is that even though the popular conception is that black holes suck everything in, actually this process of forming disks is so efficient and, and gas is so happy to, you know, has the angular momentum and is happy to be orbiting there. The bigger problem in astrophysics is how do you get material to actually fall into a black hole? How do you lose angular momentum? Um, so that material will eventually <coughs> fall into that black hole. Um, and that's a, that's a question that we can go into a little bit, but, but basically there's a lot of, um, this hot gas is orbiting around the black hole in the form of this disk, and because the gas is you know, rubbing up against each other, it, just, it creates an incredible amount of friction and heat. And that heat, um, basically, you know, the, the system, the accretion disk becomes so hot that it radiates light. And this light is, is um, it's a very efficient process, and the light coming from this accretion disk can actually outshine the entire, all of the stars in the galaxy. In addition to this process of uh, forming an accretion disk and all of this radiation, this radiation can be so powerful that it actually launches uh, strong outflow, so it can push, the radiation pressure can push on gas and, and actually, you know, affect large-scale changes in the galaxy. And as, um, uh, and also form, and, uh, form these, these relativistic jets. It's all driven, though, by this process of mass accretion inflow. So the, these are kinds of the two, uh, you know, the, the big questions.
question of my, my research is, well, how do black, supermassive black holes grow, but what effect do these supermassive black holes have on their galaxies, on their host galaxies? And another way of, of asking that question is how does mass inflow via an accretion disk lead to this energy outflow? And that's why we want to understand, you know, most of that energy being released from this accretion process is happening extremely close to the black hole. And so we want to understand what does it look like around a black hole. Um, the, so in our galaxy, you know, in, in supermassive black holes that we see in the universe, we want to understand how this accretion process happens, um, how you go from mass inflow to jets being produced and radiation being produced. But it's a difficult you know, question to answer because we only really see a snapshot of the galaxy in time. Right? So this accretion process is happening over you know, many millions of years. Um, and what we would love to do, unfortunately, in astronomy, we don't have the, the ability to, you know, produce, like, this very nice experiment of, okay, like, I'm going to throw in, you know, 100 grams of gas. And what happens? What, 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 what's the thing that's left over? Because this process happens so slowly uh, in the majority of, of accreting black hole systems and you know, over millions of years, we never really get that opportunity to have that like, special laboratory. And this is where tidal disruption events are uh, an incredibly powerful tool. So the tidal disruption event uh, is basically allowing us to do this experiment. What happens when we throw the mass of a star into a black hole? What, what, what will happen after that? And so this was an idea that was first thought of um, in the late 1980s. Um, and this is, these are two kind of very canonical pictures of uh, that we, people study tidal disruption events. You, you'll see this at basically all of the conferences. And these are two paper, um, you know, schematics from those, those early papers. So there's a supermassive black hole sitting at the center there. A star comes in on the on a you know, parabolic orbit there. And at some point, it'll get to this radius that we call the tidal disruption radius. And this is the radius at which the strong tidal forces of the black hole um, become stronger than the self-gravity of that star and rip the star apart. So by tidal forces, I just mean that you know, the gravitational pull on the, the, the side of the star that's nearer to the black hole is going to be way stronger than on the, the far side of that, that, that star. And, and, and that's that gravitational um, pull will make the, the star fall apart. And so as that star continues on its traje trajectory, it will become this kind of spaghetti um, of stellar debris <coughs> at the tidal disruption radius. Some of that, that material will just continue on its original parabolic trajectory but about half of that stellar debris is bound, gravitationally bound to the black hole and will fall back towards the black hole and eventually fall into the black hole. And, and so this is the other plot that is often shown. This is the mass fallback rate, how quickly that material is falling back towards the black hole as a function of time. And what you can see is that it takes that stellar debris will, will um, rapidly fall towards the black hole on time scales of, for, for a million solar mass black hole. And uh, you'll see basically nothing, and then this, this tidal disruption event occurs, and you see debris falling back to the bl uh, black hole and at, um, at peaks after about a month, and then it decays over time, time scales of of a year or so. Material falling into the black hole, uh, falling back towards the black hole, eventually will we'll form this accretion disk and we will see the light, in principle, we can see the light um, coming from this system uh, on, on similar time scales. And what's amazing is that we actually do see this. Um, this, is, this is an example of one 
particular tidal disruption event where uh, this is brightness as a function uh, over time. This was made, uh, an observation taken in several different energy bands, those are the different colors. And what this observation is all about is that basically this is a wide field telescope that was surveying many, many galaxies. And it, you know, before this, this particular event, it was getting, they didn't see anything from this galaxy. They were getting all of these upper limits. No, they couldn't detect any radiation. And then all of a sudden, um, there was this rise to peak. It became extremely bright as, as, um, and then decayed over time. And then after about a, a, you know, a few hundred days, it was no longer seen again. And this is kind of one of the, the telltale signs of a tidal disruption event happening. So this is an artist's representation. The folks at NASA Goddard put this together. At the center of your screen here, you can't really see it, is a supermassive black hole. And that's kind of the point. You know, we can't see these supermassive black holes when there's no material falling. There you see there's a, a supermassive black hole at the center there. Light is being warped around it. And all of a sudden, sorry, I have to go through this, a star, like our sun, gets too close. And at some radius, the tidal destruction radius, that star is ripped apart. Some of that material will make it towards the black hole, will be bound to the black hole. It'll form this accretion disk, and material will start actually accreting onto the black hole. And for a very brief period, it becomes an extremely bright object. This accretion disk becomes very bright. And so we see this just for a rise time of about a, a, a month, and then it decays as as the material all falls past the event horizon, um, we will no longer see it, and it'll just become a quiescent black hole sitting there at the center. So this field of tidal disruption events is, um, is a new field. Um, they were first seen in the, in the, in the mid-90s. There were just a, a couple of candidate events. Um, and really, in the past you know, decade or so, it's really taken off. And we're, this is a cumulative distribution of uh, just the, the number of TDEs that we've seen. We've seen so far, um, it's almost about 30 now, um, or more. Up this, this slide is a little bit old. Um, up to about last year, we were seeing one to two of tidal disruption events per year. We are observing one to two tidal disruption events per year. But now we have these new telescopes that have just come online in the past year or so, and new telescopes um, have seen eight already in, this, in the, this year alone. And the reason for this is because we're, we're basically observing large patches of the sky, basically doing all sky surveys and looking, you know, um, going back to the same point in the sky every in a couple of days, and looking for new things, new transients that occur in the sky. And thankfully, this process of tidal disruption events is a fairly common phenomenon in the, in the universe. So once every 10,000 years uh, in a galaxy, we expect that this process should be happening. And if you're surveying hundreds of thousands of galaxies every couple of days, you're bound to find many of these um, events happening. And so this is a really great opportunity for seeing what does it look like when, you know, first of all, for, um, you know, we know what's gone into these black holes. It's, it's you know, half of the star. So what happens after that? And it's also a great way of studying quiescent black holes, these kind of, you know, naked black holes that we wouldn't normally know about because they don't have material falling um, you know, falling towards them. Um, so this is, that's the field of tidal disruption events, and I'll give you just one, uh, finish up with one example of how we are using these tidal disruption events to understand how material falls into black holes and how they produce a lot of radiation and strong jets. Um, and so this is an example my own work of uh, this, the tidal disruption event that we call SWIFT J1644. 
it was it's called Swift J because the, well the J and the, all the numbers is is the coordinates, but it was found by the Swift um, X-ray satellite, and um, it basically Swift was monitoring this this uh, had an all sky monitor in the X-ray band, uh, which is a particularly great band for finding transients associated with black holes. Um, because in, whereas in the optical you see a lot of transients just due to like stellar flares, um, in the X-rays you won't. These stellar flares don't have enough. They're not energetic enough to produce emission in the X-ray band. Um, and so in x-rays, you can be pretty sure if you see something that it's, uh, it's something due to some kind of black hole activity. And in 2011, this uh, tidal disruption event was, was uh, discovered. And you can see it has this uh, telltale light curve, this um, strong, fast rise. Basically, there was no x-ray source before, this, this, um, before th these observations. And it, so there was a fast uh, rise to peak, and as we followed this thing for several hundred days, um, we saw this slow decay over time. And um, this is what the image looks like. So not quite as impressive as the Event Horizon Telescope image of M87. Uh, it just looks like a point source. This uh, black hole is is is. Three billion light years away, um, and sitting, and it was not something that was actively accreting a lot of material before this time. Um, but when Swift finally saw this bright flare, we saw this. Uh, this is what the image looked like, and this is basically what a point source looks like to the Swift telescope. Those kind of um, those um, right, yeah. spider legs coming out are just artifacts. Um, from, from the, the, the optics of the, of the mirror. And so what we're trying to understand is, okay, we, we know that there is something curious happening associated with, this, with the, this black hole, but what does it actually look like when, when you turn on a black hole? And so for this, um, we want to think about how do we image something without actually spatially resolving it? And this is where reverberation light echoes come in. So the reverberation you know, is something that we know of you know, just with sound. Um, and so it's, it's kind of easy to, to make a parallel there. I am speaking to you, and you hear my voice directly. But you also hear echoes off of the wall. And if you could map out all of the echoes off of the wall, then you could basically map out what this room looks like because you know the speed of sound through this medium. And so this is kind of just showing if you had an impulse of sound and you could map out over time all of the, the response of those echoes, then you could use the time delay between that direct impulse multiplied by the speed of sound and you'd get the distance to the wall. So just like that, you know, using echolocation to map out a dark cave sound off, bouncing off of a room, we can do the same thing using light to, to map out what it must look like in these scales that are much too small for us to spatially resolve with our telescopes. It's a little bit more complicated uh, than just echoes off bouncing off of uh, a wall. <coughs> And the reason for that is, you know, it's not just a simple reflection, but rather it's, it's photoelectric absorption and fluorescence. Um, and so this is kind of, and it's just a schematic of, of showing, you know, what we think is, is happening here. You have high energy photons coming from the innermost regions closest to the black hole. And that's denoted by this star that you see here. But it's really material from, from, from the accretion flow around the black hole. That, that, uh, you know, that region will emit kind of isotropically in all directions. And some of those photons will come to us directly three billion years later. But some of those X-ray photons will irradiate the accretion disk. And we will see a response of the accretion disk over time. 
And it's not just a simple reflection, but rather as those photons irradiate the accretion disk, um, it will basically excite iron atoms in the, or, or you know, all of the atoms, uh, uh, the ions in the accretion disk. And as those photons hit, in particular, we, we, we observed iron atoms, it'll cause an electron to jump up to a, a next highest energy level. Are you remembering your chemistry classes from way back when? Um, and then over time, it will de-excite that, that electron will um, fall back down to its lower energy level and produce a photon at a particular line emission. <coughs> Basically, this kind of isotropically emitting source will, er, flur, uh, will irradiate the disk, cause this fluorescence of emission lines, and we will see that sometime later. That is the basic principle. And what we're trying to do is measure the time delay between the emission lines that we observe off of the accretion disk and this direct primary source. And it gets a little bit more complicated than the first slide that I showed you, whereas, you know, of course, if you had this delta function, just an impulse flash of sound or light, you could kind of easily tr track the, the echoes that are bouncing off or the the light that's echoing off of the accretion disk. But it's not ever just one impulse. In fact, this bright source at the center is constantly shining, you know, varying very quickly. And this is what we see as we observe it. So what we have to do is use signal processing techniques to kind of map out to the time delays between different energy bands. But what we find is, these reverberation light echoes. And you can see this, this is, you know, in, in reality we're doing kind of Fourier transforms and doing signal processing techniques, but you can see this actually just in the light curve itself. So we see these, um, this is the brightness as a function of time again, and what you see in blue is that primary source of the center, and the right light curve in red is the, that iron line that's reprocessed off of the disk. And you can see it's shifted with respect to the primary source, the radiating source. And this is kind of more um, uh, akin to the kinds of things that I look at. It's basically the lag, the time lag that we're measuring, these light <coughs> that we're measuring as a function of energy. And so you can see at the energy of that emission line, there is a time delay associated with the extra light travel time that both these photons have had to take um, before traveling three billion years to hit our detector. And that's kind of amazing to measure time delays of, you know, 100 seconds uh, at, around a source that is three billion light years away. And you can use that kind of, we're, we're doing better modeling than this, but basically, um, very generally speaking, this 100 second time delay multiplied by the speed of light gives you a distance. And that sounds huge, but actually, when you consider the size of the galaxy in which it resides, it's on scales that are smaller than what the Event Horizons Telescope resolved spatially this past week in a source that's 3 billion light years away. So that's pretty cool that we can use these tech, these signal processing techniques that are kind of you know, used in many other fields to map out what the structure is around these black holes. And so this is kind of um, putting it all together. What we think that we have learned from this title, this particular title, disruption event. Um, what you're seeing now is after this black hole has torn apart this star that half of that stellar debris is falling towards the black hole and eventually we think that it forms an accretion disk. And what you're seeing now is a kind of um, a cross-section through this torus. So you're viewing it um, as a cross-section through this kind of torus of, of material. And uh, this is just like a schematic that the Goddard Press people put together for us. We think that we're seeing, because of these very short time delays that we're seeing, 
and it says that we're basically mapping out scales very close to the black hole. And uh, we see like some primary flashes of light that are kind of just propagating off through this accretion flow. And from these observations, uh, we were able to tell that you know, stellar debris is falling towards the black hole through this accretion disk. That accretion disk is producing a lot of radiation, and it's actually pushing up the disk itself and making this disk no longer into, like, in, from a thin disk, it's gone to something extremely puffy just because of the strong radiation and pressure. And we were able to measure that mass is being pushed out of this system at 0.3 to 0.5 the speed of light. Because of this accretion process and producing radiation, um, and we can measure these strong velocity outflows. We were also able to measure, like, basically how wide the opening angle of this, of this accretion disk must be. Because we're seeing these really small light travel time delays, we know that we must be looking, peering very close to the black hole, which kind of, which gave us constraint on, um, basically, the geometry of, of how wide this opening angle is. And the idea is that we, in this particular object, um, it's, it's extremely bright, and we seem to have a view where we're kind of looking face on to the system. Um, and so these light echoes, you know, we are kind of looking down as the observers, and we're seeing these light echoes propagate out. So that's all that I wanted to tell you about. Um, I hope that I've convinced you that supermassive black holes are important for understanding galaxy formation. Um, and we have a, a, a unique tool by looking at these tidal disruption events. Um, and reverberation light echoes have been measured in one tidal disruption event so far, this object. But it's also something that we're, we can use on basically any kind of accreting black hole system. And we've done this um, not just on supermassive black holes, but on stellar mass black holes. And it's, a, it's an independent uh, and, and powerful way of kind of measuring out what it must look like imaging uh, the area around the black hole. So thank you.